I will begin us with a prayer at this time. Father, we are so grateful for the blessing of your uh, uh, forgiveness, for your kindnesses and the physical blessings we receive, but most especially, Father, that we, we, we receive through your son shed blood the spiritual blessings that uh, are of most significant importance to us. Thank you, Father, for giving us uh, Christians who've gone before, like the Apostle Paul, who, uh, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, have recorded for us your wisdom uh, in many situations that we find in our daily lives. Thank you now for the letter to the Corinthians and uh, this second version that we have of his letter and for the opportunity that we have to look at our ministry as Christians and our relationship to one another and to the world. Thank you for uh, the leaders of this congregation, for all of those who are encouraging the spreading of your message throughout this community. Father, we pray your blessing upon uh, us as we seek to honor and glorify you in our lives. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Okay. Thank you for uh, joining us tonight. If you've just uh, joined, as several have, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians, and we will be uh, discussing from verse 14 and following uh, through the first verse of chapter 7 of Paul's uh, discussion of Christians' relationship to unbelievers. Uh, last week, we saw that Paul made an appeal uh, to the Corinthians to open up their hearts uh, to him. And he, in, in, uh, in turn, has already opened up his heart to them. They apparently uh, had closer relationships with unbelievers than they did with Paul, and that's probably what contributed to some of their problems. And so he pleads with them not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers, uh, in order that they might receive the promises of everlasting fellowship uh, with God as their father. Then in uh, the first verse of chapter 7, Paul summarizes his pleas to the Corinthians that he's made in chapter 6. That's one of the interesting things about how the, um, the scholars of age uh, separated the verses and the chapters in these letters. They're not inspired, and sometimes the first verse in the next chapter actually goes with the previous chapter. That's probably true here today, and we will include it uh, with that idea in mind. So we're going to look, starting at, at verse 14, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 through 16. Uh, Do not be bound, uh, some texts say yoked, together with unbelievers. For what partnership, some texts say fellowship, have righteousness and lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony, uh, some translations say accord, has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Paul starts out here making the argument that there can be no equality uh, between believers and unbelievers. Uh, he's talking literally uh, about those spiritual priorities, but he says here, uh, essentially in the Greek, we have do not, he's essentially saying stop. Stop becoming unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now, we know of this word yoke uh, from a farming metaphor where two animals, typically oxen, were connected together at the neck and the shoulders by a wooden device that kept them together and, and enabled them to work uh, with their strength together to accomplish some task. And Paul uses this idea, this metaphor, about Christians being yoked or bound uh, to unbelievers. Uh, so the idea he's basically saying, uh, in simple words, don't do it. Now, it comes from Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 10, if you're looking for the uh, historical background. Here, you see an example exactly of two animals that were yoked together that were not helpful to each other. Uh, in the example in Deuteronomy, it was an ox and a donkey. Can you imagine an ox and a donkey pulling a plow through a field? Uh, 
uh, and trying to keep a straight line. Uh, donkeys don't like to do anything uh, that they're supposed to, it seems. Uh, maybe that's, that's not entirely fair, uh, but they're different in size, different in strength, different in uh, their disposition. Uh, and so it would be a real challenge. They'd be pulling against each other and the, the farmer who's trying to work them is gonna be stressed out. And, and Paul uses this metaphor to give a warning about priorities that Christians make uh, with those who are unbelievable, un unbelievers. Paul speaks then to the Cor Corinthians and is pointing specifically at some of the relationships that they've either brought with them as they became Christians or that they've entered into afterwards, relationships that were making it difficult for reconciliation with Paul. Uh, what Paul is, is, of course, concerned about are those things that are going to have a negative spiritual impact that will negatively impact uh, our eternal destiny. So 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, uh, Paul begins uh, challenging the Corinthian Christians to think about the priorities in their relationships, to think about how that's affecting their religious and spiritual fellowship, and how it interferes with them working towards the same uh, spiritual and eternal goals. Uh, for example, uh, a temptation in their culture would include intentionally fellowshipping the eating of meat uh, that a non-believer is dedicating to a pagan god. And so maybe their friend, their partner in business, their neighbor that they've developed this relationship with uh, encourages them to join him in offering this meat to a particular idol. And this creates a temptation for them. And evidently, some of them were not uh, able to overcome it. So the, the Corinthian Christians still struggled with the idolatry that Paul mentioned in his first letter. In chapter uh, 8 of 1 Corinthians, uh, verses 1 through 13, he talks to them specifically about eating meats sacrificed to idols, and, and he acknowledges, yes, it's true that there are no other gods, but if you are involved in the relationship with this particular person and he believes uh, that this food is being offered as a sacrifice uh, to a, a God that exists, when in fact it doesn't, he's saying, don't do that. Uh, take into consideration your influence. Uh, his key, Paul's key, uh, in uh, another chapter, chapter 10, just a little bit later in 1 Corinthians, uh, showed that the, the Israelites leaving Egypt were idolaters. They brought their uh, house to, uh, idols with them. They kept some of the practices, some of the fears, and some of the trust that they had learned in Egypt. And, and Paul points to them as an example, uh, and he warns them uh, to flee from idolatry. Do not do what those Israelites did that resulted in so many problems in their journey to the land that God had, had promised them. Uh, he's especially concerned about the influence of uh, non-believers. It's one thing to be in their presence. It's one thing uh, to spend time with them or have transactions with them. Uh, he's not excluding all. He's just talking about those relationships with, with unbelievers that are going to involve influence to turn uh, away from God. The word fellowship here uh, indicates that Paul is speaking of more than just being there in the same village or in the same uh, marketplace or in the same business. He's talking about something a little more intimate than whether you are influencing them or they are influencing uh, you. He's not suggesting that Christians never associate with unbelievers. Uh, if, if, if he was teaching that, how would we ever reach them with the gospel? We have to have some association in order for us to be able to have influence. And that's what he's talking about, that the influence is going in a positive direction. Uh, and so you will remember that he talked about this idea in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. He, he warns uh, the Romans and us as uh, those who read that word 
uh, to not be conformed to this world, but instead uh, uh, to be renewed or transformed uh, in our mind. And this is what he's concerned about with the Corinthians. Uh, he doesn't want them joining together with unbelievers in such a way that this transformation is hindered. He doesn't uh, want them finding that they're more gr uh, greatly influenced uh, by the so-called spiritual uh, beliefs of their neighbors than they are by people like the Apostle Paul. So, uh, as an unequal yoke or an ungodly fluence, uh, it doesn't have to simply in our age um, be a neighbor or someone at work or someone uh, at school. It can be a book, it can be a movie, uh, can be a television show, can be uh, simply the internet. Uh, it can even be Christian friends who have worldly priorities. These kind of things, Paul is warning, can be an influence and can be an influence that is harmful. Uh, possibly there are a significant number of Christians who are not very careful about the things they allow to influence their lives. Um, it may be that uh, they uh, believe that they are strong enough to avoid a negative influence, and perhaps that's true uh, in some circumstances, especially if they're not alone. But we need to take seriously the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, when he said, do not be deceived, bad company corrupts good morals. So there needs to be an, an, an open uh, observation and evaluation of the influences that we have. Are unbelievers influencing us or are we influencing uh, them? So we sometimes need to be more, more careful. Uh, it needs to come back uh, to the simple principle then uh, uh, that we've just mentioned in Romans chapter 12, verse two. The question we might ask ourselves, are we being conformed to this world are we being transformed by the renewing of our mind? That's a foundation, a principle that Paul establishes here uh, with the church in Corinth because he's definitely been having this kind of problem with them. He describes some characteristics um, that they should have as uh, the kingdom of God uh, and that they can evaluate to determine if they are making progress uh, towards towards God. For example, he says, light has no fellowship with darkness in verse 14. The, he's, of course, pointing uh, to literal darkness and literal light, and Paul reminds the Corinthians that darkness can exi cannot exist where light is. That's an impossibility. So he's using this metaphor uh, spiritually based on what they physically know. Because of their faith in Jesus, the Corinthians have become light uh, in the world. They are a light of God. They are children of light. In fact, Ephesians, uh, Paul tells them in 5 verse 8, uh, we are children of light because of our faith in God. Christians have fellowship with God, 1 John chapter 1 verse 3. We have a fellowship uh, with Christ, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 9. We have fellowship with the Holy Spirit, 2 Corinthians 13, verse 4, and Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. We have fellowship with the sufferings of Christ. We looked at two weeks ago in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. We have fellowship with the body and the blood of Christ, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 10. And we have fellowship with one another. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. There are many other verses that speak of the, the fellowship we have in positive, uh, uh, strengthening spiritual relationships. And Paul wants to emphasize, because of your faith, you now have this characteristic that you are a light wherever you go. And as the light you are uh, potentially having the opportunity to dispel darkness. Uh, and he's concerned uh, that wherever they go with whomever they spend time, that rather than darkness increasing, uh, dark, darkness should be driven out. 
So he tells them again in verse 15 something else. Christ has no harmony or accord with Belial. We don't see this word very often. In fact, it's only used here uh, in the New Testament. It's borrowed from Hebrew, transliterated into Greek. We don't even have an English equivalent. The meaning is worthlessness or wickedness. Uh, here it's used as another word uh, for Satan, as the one who is the encourager of behavior and a, and a future that is worthless or, or, or wicked. It's used um, in the Old Testament to describe people who are notoriously wicked and scandalous. And so uh, Paul says, Christ has no harmony or accord with Belial. What does that say about his people? Well, uh, as his people having fellowship with worthless, wicked, scandalous behavior is not consistent with who we are and who we uh, can become. So he goes on in verse 15, the second part of the verse, and says a believer has nothing in common uh, with an unbeliever. This is a pretty um, a simple statement to stop and consider uh, as far as its consequences. Uh, take some examples. Their thoughts are different. The believer uh, thinks on the things of God, not simply on the things of man. Their actions are different. The believer seeks to please God and not simply themselves. Uh, their purposes are different. The believer seeks to glorify God and not man. Their trusts are different. The believer trusts in God and not uh, themselves. Their hopes are different. The believer, uh, he hopes in God. He does not hope uh, in himself. And so he's, he's making a list of characteristics of those people who are children of light, who are children of God. And he's pointing to where we are headed. We aren't going to be there perfectly. We saw that was Paul's message uh, in, the, in the book of Philippians. We are not going to be perfect in this life. It's a period of sanctification where we grow to be more like Jesus. In order to grow to be more like him, we need to take a moment and stop and think about what is he like? And that's what Paul has just done. Uh, he's talked uh, about how it might apply uh, in, in contrast to those in the community uh, that we know who are unbelievers. He goes on in verse 16, the first part there, and speaks of the temple of God having no agreement with idols. And so you had the place where people went to worship an idol, which was often called the temple. Uh, and then you have the temple of God where idolatry cannot have a part. The interesting thing is in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 16 through 17, and then later on in chapter 6, 19 through 20, Paul writes of individual Christians as being the temples of God. We are the temple of God. Why? Because the Spirit of God dwells within us. And because temples are holy places and should be protected against things that would defile a holy place. Uh, the point that Paul is making is the Corinthians, as well as, as we should in our application of this text, we should protect our hearts and our minds as holy places before the Lord. Uh, stop uh, perhaps and think about uh, my thoughts, my actions, my purposes, my trust, my hopes. Is this making my heart and my mind a little brighter or is it making it a little dimmer? Uh, is it cleaning it up or is it tarnishing it uh, a little bit? They needed to make some serious changes. There were some serious problems that occurred uh, in the church at Corinth and part of it had to do with their view of single-mindedness and devotion to God and to who he is and what he's given uh, as guidelines for us to live. Simply looking to Jesus uh, and, and listening to him and see how he lived uh, would be a, an important way uh, to make sure that the temple of God that we are uh, remains pure. 
Paul has already warned them uh, about the sin uh, of the church having fellowship with demons. Um, that seems like uh, an odd idea. We don't run across it very often uh, in the scriptures, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, 20 through 20, uh, 20 through 22, Paul wrote, the things with the Gentiles sacrificed, they sacrificed to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to become sharers in demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? We are not stronger than he, are we? The first reality that they needed to accept is that if they uh, are joining in their neighbor, their friend, their colleague, uh, joining with them, and offering meat to an idol and eating meat as part of worship that's been offered to an idol, they're not really uh, doing something benign. It's not something of no consequence. They are worshiping a demon um, because that's the only spiritual being that would encourage them to worship anyone or anything besides God. And so they need to know this is a serious thing. But it's not just serious for them. It's serious for their partners, their friends, their relatives, those people whom they have time to spend with, that they know that there is a God. Uh, and that this worship uh, of an idol is not the worship of the God, the creator of this uh, universe. And so they need to practice it first themselves. He's not advocating the breakup of marriage. Uh, you'll remember in the in the first letter there was some confusion about uh, you know if uh, if I'm married to an unbeliever and I become a Christian then is it necessary that I break up the relationship or maybe I okay I'm a business person I had this contract with a person uh, in business who's not a uh, a believer do I need to break that contract with them um, because I can't have any fellowship with these people. Paul is not advocating that kind of application. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, in fact, verses 12 and 13, he's already told them. Um, he says, but I, but to the rest, uh, I say not the Lord, that if my brother has a wife uh, who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. As far as it is concerned with us, we need to honor those relationships uh, like marriage where we've made a commitment uh, and an opportunity uh, to reach out to them and make it work. Uh, now in a business partnership, our yes should be yes and our no should be no, and people should be able to take us at our word. If we've agreed to do something as a Christian, even with a non-believer, we should keep our word. Now, he's not telling us to make unethical or illegal uh, business decisions. That's a totally different subject. But he's warning about that kind of closeness, dependency, um, that is going to perhaps threaten or turn our direction uh, away from God. Christians basically... Um, we're seeing here must not develop a relationship with a non-believer that would either lead to a compromise of Christian pr principles and ethics or one that would jeopardize the consistency uh, of their Christian example. Um, th there was a brother in Lubbock when I was going to school there uh, who started a ministry in a, in a, a prison there, state prison uh, in Texas. He's actually quite known for his prison work and written some interesting books, but um, he had converted a large number of these prisoners. Uh, in fact, he was so effective at it that the, the prison administration liked to send him and those prisoners who followed uh, Christ into uh, other areas of the prison because it would be a good a uh, chance that people would change and they would live differently. And so some of these Christians in prison uh, were reading the scriptures and it said you needed to have elders. And they said, well, we're a congregation. 
um, we should be having elders. And someone said, but what about the part that says we should have a good reputation from the outside? And I thought, hmm, this is going to be a challenge. Uh, but of course, they're going the other direction. And they would have time to show uh, that they had actually changed, that they had actually uh, overcome their reputation. What you don't want to do uh, is to go the other way where your reputation becomes tarnished because of your association uh, with people who are perhaps influencing you. Uh, and some people then might call into question uh, the legitimacy of your relationship to these kinds of people. So this is where we are. Uh, Paul is uh, talking about certain characteristics that should be found in those who are children of light, children of God, and the kingdom of God, and they should be careful not to have associations with uh, non-believers or even with worldly Christians that might lead them away. They should be careful of their commitments. Then there are some implications uh, to this promise, uh, these promises that Paul has spoken of in chapter 6. Uh, in chapter 16, again, the second part, um, as God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God. And they will be my people. Verse 17, therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. In chapter 7, verse 1, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates the body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. So this is what Paul says, here's where you're going. If you're not going in that direction, you need to change course. And of course, many of them were not. And he wants them to see that it's important what he's telling them about their relationship with God. He says, God says, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. He's quoting from Ezekiel 37, 26 through 27, where the prophet tells us God is in the midst of his temple. And because we are his temple, he is in the midst of us. And of course, this makes sense. For every one of them who'd been baptized into Christ, they knew that they not only received forgiveness of sins, but they received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was with them. God dwells uh, among his people. And he's reminding the Corinthians, God said this to Ezekiel, the prophet. And the principle is still true. And he also refers them to Isaiah 52, verse 11. Um, there the prophet tells them and us how, how we should make uh, that temple that we are a holy place. He says, come out from among them and be separate. Do not touch what is unclean. So Paul quotes this, this separating ourselves from the sin of the world around us and the influence of those who practice these things is evidence that we view God as our Father and that we want him to receive us. We're paying attention to the spiritual reality that exists by paying attention to how our spiritual life is infected uh, with or without uh, the, the, the sins of the flesh and the sins of the world. We don't uh, want to uh, have what's um, common in those who rebel against God to become part of our lives. We need to dispel the darkness because of the presence of God who dwells within us. This separating ourselves then um, is evidence to not only other Christians, not simply to Paul, but it's evidence to those people in the community who are observing how we live. Um, you know, my uh, 
grandmother for many years, she, she worked as a, as a waitress uh, in a number of restaurants in California. And then she went to school, became a dietitian and worked in the kitchen at the school. But when she worked in the restaurant, um, she would listen to some of the things as she was serving people that they were saying. Uh, and, you know, she'd kind of roll her eyes, not being a Christian. And she's at home one time, and one of these guys with several other came knocking on the door, inviting her to church. And she's thinking, what? After what I heard you saying in the restaurant, you're inviting me to church? See, Paul is concerned about the same thing. How can we and how can they share the gospel message unless they confess and say, I'm sorry about what I said? at the restaurant, I was wrong, that was sinful. And I repented of that and asked for God's forgiveness. And I asked for your forgiveness. You know, my grandmother remembered that for years and years and years. We need to be careful. We are the temple of God. And where we go uh, becomes a message to those who are observing. And it's an opportunity uh, for, us, for us to show them that not only can we change, they also can change. We're not bound to the culture of the country or the world. We have an opportunity to look to the kingdom and bind ourselves to that kind of holy living. Um, a life that realizes that fellowship with, with God involves not only the cleansing blood of his son, but a repentant life that seeks to be holy as he is holy. It's not over when we come out of the water. We're just beginning that new life. And sometimes there are temptations for people to think, okay, well, I was baptized. Then. You know, my sins are washed away. It's okay. And to slide back into the old habits uh, that were part of our life. And that's why Paul says to the Philippians, this is a process. The Holy Spirit will help you. The word of God will guide you. You need to persevere. You need to move ahead. Uh, and become like the one uh, who saved us. Therefore, Paul basically uh, says at the end of chapter six and beginning of chapter seven, we must be separate, separate uh, if we wish to be the children of God. He emphasizes in, in chapter uh, six, verses 17, uh, this need uh, to grow, to be different, to be like the children of God. It's not enough to have negative goodness. Have you ever thought about that? Negative goodness. Negative goodness is sometimes what you hear uh, non-Christians say is, is the way that Christians live. I do not, I do not, I do not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And they think that's all Christianity is. It's just saying, no, I don't do that. I don't do that. Uh, but uh, in, in Mark chapter 10, verse 17, you'll remember that a man came to Jesus and asked what he must do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus told him, uh, uh, discussed with him about the law. And it came up, these uh, uh, phrases, uh, don't, don't, don't. Uh, what we're not supposed to, to do. Don't take the name of your Lord in vain. Don't worship idols, for example. All of these don'ts. Uh, and the young man, well, well, I don't know exactly how young he was, but uh, he was confident that he had done that from his youth. He had what you might call negative goodness. And so Jesus made just one suggestion. One thing you lack. Go and sell all you possess and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. In verse 22, but at these words, the man was saddened. And he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. Having this negative goodness is not enough. It doesn't challenge us to see where our heart is and how we're growing. This man's possessions were worth more to him than eternal life. And it's no wonder Jesus could say, and what will a man give in exchange for his soul? 
And this is what he, Paul's saying to the Corinthians. Um, you, you have to have positive faith because that's evidence that you are light dispelling the darkness, that you have made a change. Uh, what the rich man had abstained from was fine. Uh, but it neglects the positive work and the positive influence that God has given to us. When Jesus gave uh, what we call the Great Commission, his last command in Matthew 28, uh, 18 through 20, um, it wasn't a don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, into all the world, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all things that I have commanded you, and I will be with you to the end of the age. It was all positive stuff. It was all positive stuff that would lead another soul uh, out of the hand, a grasp of Satan. And those are the positive things that we need for every good thing we do honors Christ, glorifies him, and helps people to stop and think. What would cause a person to do these things? In verses 17 and 18, we're reminded of the words of Peter uh, in 1 Peter chapter 1. 14 through 19. It's in some ways a parallel message. In verse 14, Peter writes, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in your behavior. Because it is written, you should be holy for I am holy. If you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. So here we find Peter making a similar argument. It cost the blood of God's son to cleanse us. Let us not despise that, that wonderful, magnificent grace that came to this world through Christ. But instead, as obedient children, be conformed to that one who is our old brother and also king of our kingdom. You shall be holy for I am holy. Uh, Paul quotes uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, from Jeremiah 31, verse 9. And his goal there. Uh, is to show the benefit of separating from the worldly influence. Uh, he quotes saying, I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters. Not only are we forgiven to the grace of Christ's sacrifice, but God takes us to be his sons and daughters. Uh, and, and to do that, we need to be separating ourselves on a continually basis, continual basis from the, the ways and practices of the world that we brought with us. Uh, this was the challenge early on in this text that Paul gave the Corinthians about the nation of Israel. You could get the nation of Israel out of Egypt, as they say, but it was difficult to get Egypt out of Israel. They struggled with that all the way. Uh, and some of them, it was their undoing. And that's a tragedy. Jeremiah lets us know that we can be sons and daughters. God wants that kind of intimate relationship with us. And Paul wanted an intimate relationship with the church in Corinth. 
He said, my heart is open to you. Please open your heart to me. They were opening their hearts to influences that were harmful. And Paul knew that, and he was concerned. But before they could have that kind of relationship that should occur in a church, they had to be honest. They had to be willing to give and not simply take. Uh, and that's the message for those who are seeking to be like Christ. In, in chapter 7, verse 1, he ends with a plea for holiness. He comes back to this idea. Uh, basically, therefore, since you have these promises, uh, uh, principles uh, that God has given through the prophets throughout uh, the ages, um, and, and he's quoted in chapter 6, he says, here's two things, two things. Cleanse yourself from all filthiness. That's the first part of verse 1. Second of all, perfect holiness in the fear of God. That's the summary of what he's telling the Corinthians in his plea for them to listen to his desire to be close to them and to the word that he's sharing with them from God and to be careful about those relationships that are drawing them away, not just from Paul, but ultimately away from Christ. Demons do not have our best interest in mind. And if you're playing on the devil's football field and you're playing by the devil's rules, even if you're a Christian, I guarantee you, you're going to lose. You've got to play by God's rules and stay on his feet and be the light in the darkness that those who are struggling in their lives can find a hope that will set them free. Paul basically wants the, 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 the church at Corinth, and he wants us to understand as well that we need to have spiritual equality in our relationships, in our partnerships. We can't be unequally yoked. Uh, unless your spiritual values and goals strongly agree with those of a potential partner, whether in marriage or business or some other partnership, getting involved in a deep and permanent relationship will be like yoking a donkey and an ox. You will always be out of step with each other. One will be doing the heavy pulling while dragging the other along, and you will never be able to plow in a straight line. So he's warning them, don't do that. Think about these relationships. It's not saying don't have any associations. He's not saying if you're married, uh, leave your spouse. He's not saying that. He's saying as you have opportunity to consider commitments in the future, ask yourselves, is this helping me? Will this hinder me? Uh, and if we found ourselves getting uh, too close to an unbeliever in a, in a friendship or maybe a romantic relationship or a business partnership, ask ourselves a few questions. Why am I drawn to this person when they have the opposite priorities of my faith? When they have the opposite priorities of Christ? Number two, have I seen myself compromise my biblical principles as a result of this relationship? How? Am I going along to get along for some future goal in this partnership, whatever it is? That's a challenge. Because once you start down the road of compromise, it's difficult to turn back. Number three, is this relationship affecting my current relationships with believers? Is this relationship with an unbeliever drawing me away from believers and from God? I've seen this happen a lot, and I, I suspect that most of you have as well. And so it's something to think about. Number four, before God and with his help, do I need to put on the brakes in some relationship or partnership before it becomes so intimate that it has a negative permanent effect on 
This is worth thinking about in advance. God has designed us for close relationships, but he means for them to be healthy, wholesome, pure, supportive, and balanced. We'll never find a perfect partner. What we want, uh, whether in business or relationships, is to have someone who's willing to walk in the same direction, who's willing to experience sanctification and become more and more the light of Christ to dispel darkness. You may never be exactly at the same stage, but when one's pulling off to the left and you need to go straight, that's a big, big challenge. So uh, God designed us to have healthy relationships, pure relationships, supportive relationships, wholesome and balanced. When they become unhealthy and destructive or lopsided, it's time to think about the problem and maybe get some help to help us focus on what God wants us to do. That's the idea behind what Paul teaches here uh, to the Corinthians. Unfortunately, they developed relationships with people who were idolaters, and it had caused harm not only um, in their relationship with Paul, but in their relationship with God. They'd gotten wrong priorities. Um, Paul's trying to turn them back and give them insight in what to do, and we can practice these principles ourselves. Please join me as we close in prayer. Father, we are so thankful to have this honest guidance from the Apostle Paul, and to know, Father, that his words have uh, helped people throughout the ages. We pray for wisdom, Father, that you'll help us to have uh, insight in, in knowing uh, by asking these certain questions, whether the commitments uh, we are making will encourage the light in our lives to shine, will encourage the darkness to be dispelled, uh, and will help us to be those who can uh, give people a, a, a path uh, to eternity uh, with your son. Thank you, Father, for all of the people in our lives that have come before us that help, helped us to know you and to know your son and help us to be those people who do the same with others who follow behind us. Help us, Father, to focus always not simply on uh, the, the negative good, but the positive good. Help us, Father, to be uh, focused on making decisions and living in such a way that results in positive, eternal consequences. All these things, Father, we pray and thank you for in your son's name. Amen.